Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. Take me to the distant past. That's what my ex-wife said during our divorce proceedings. After I'd blown through our collective savings on Eurorack modular synthesizers and other musical doodads purchased from Signal Sounds. It was all reasonably priced. I just bought a lot of it. And that gives me an idea for... I'm fairly sure that at this stage my obscenely large modular cabinet of flashing lights and wires must surely be capable of time travel. After all... Time always did seem to pass more quickly when I played it at home versus on stage. And so, I shall patch the outputs back into the inputs and use it to travel to the past, to when I still had money and a wife and I'd do it all differently. Who am I even kidding? Nope, I'll match myself right back into signalsounds.com and do it again. They've got a brand new website filled with all manner of wondrous musical toys and Eurorack modular doodles, which they ship worldwide. I'm sad about the emptiness that's all around me, but choice mountain, here I come. And while I'm back in the past, I'll buy the world's stock of QMMGs, stick them in storage for a few years and then flip them on reverb. I'm going to be a billionaire. So to purchase a modular synthesizer bit by bit, safe in the knowledge that you can absolutely stop at any time and not ruin your life, visit the newly updated Signalsounds.com. That's Signalsounds.com. Why We Bleep is also sponsored by thonk.co.uk. Hey, you. Who, me? Yeah, you. You want to build things, tinker? Who you calling a tinker, you little tinker? No, I mean you want to make stuff. What, like frying pans? No, I mean like musical things, modules, desktop synths, noise generators. Well, maybe. What do these noise generators sound like? They sound like frying pans with food on. And are they cheaper than buying off the shelf? Yes. And do I get the satisfaction of building myself? Yes. And is everything included so I don't gotta find pots? Yes. They have full kits and partial kits. And do they got frying pans? No, I kind of need a new frying pan. So to purchase DIY modules, desktop synths and samplers and frying pans, no frying pans and no frying pans, visit thonk.co.uk. That's thonk.co.uk, you little tinker. Hi, Sausages. Today we present a conversation with the absolutely wonderful Everything Everything. Now, if you're a fan of the band, how do you describe Everything Everything's music? They're a band and they have lots of guitars on stage. Three, well, two guitars and a bass guitar. So they look very bandy. But I think of Everything Everything in many respects is very kind of electronic, at least they really appeal to me as a person who predominantly listens to electronic music. It's hard for me to find bands that I find really interesting to listen to. And Everything Everything are absolutely one of those bands. They are really creative and make interesting, bold, odd choices and make songs that transform on a sixpence and are packed with all manner of interesting twists and turns. They are really good at writing earworms. Now, what you might not know about Everything Everything as you look at them on stage with their two guitars, one bass guitar, is the fact that Alex, certainly from the band, Alex Robertshaw, is a modular head. Oh, yes, he is one of us. He has got a beautiful Schwemann system and a beautiful Verbos system. 
which if you watch the video version of this on YouTube, you can see behind me. Uh, and he uses Schwayman stuff to make everything everything, and Verbos, obviously, as well. But, but the Schwayman especially for processing. Uh, he's using Modular in a really um, pointed, like, you know, a good way. Uh, and we talk in the you know this conversation about how that is done, how they start writing music and, and where Modular fits into that whole thing. My interest with this conversation was to try and understand some of their process. How do they do it? Especially given that the band don't all live together. You know, where I went to Alex's house to record this, I had to speak to John remotely because John's in Manchester. How do they play live? And trying to eke out some of the, the kind of tips and tricks in as much as is possible. Because at the end of the day, to write music like everything, everything, you need to be everything, everything, uh, which we're not. Uh, but I'm glad we live in a world that has them in. Uh, so I will chat more afterwards. I think it's time to speak to the Japs. This is Why We Bleep with Everything, Everything. Thanks. basics of it is that John and I will write the songs together and then we take it to the other guys and sort of get you know feedback on what's good and what's not yeah argue over the songs for a long time until they become the songs that people hear I'll write something and I'll just send it to John he'll sing something on it and then send it back and then we'll be like is that good or not or whatever do you both like will you both write whole tracks by yourselves sometimes yeah it's it's very dependent on what we feel it needs. If if one of us writes something and we're like, that's the song and doesn't feel like it needs anything more, then we'll probably not <laughs> let anyone add anything to it. If it's like, I think I could tweak this here or this could do the middle eight or why don't we change the key? Those kind of things are where the collaborations happen a lot. The songs sort of are getting written like all the way through up until the last minute. There's, you know, arrangement changes and all sorts of stuff changes all the time. So it's not like a, we don't sort of finish writing and then record and then, you know, it's not like one, two, three kind of thing. It's always like, I'll be just about to do something for mix. And I just think like, you know, this is just shit. <laughs> Let's just change this round here or do that, you know, or whatever. And um, sometimes we just do that. We did that with like software, great man. that was like a four bar loop, you know, done on verbal stuff. And then I had to cut that down. I decided last minute, I was like, you know, I'm so bored of hearing the fourth chord. So I just cut out the fourth chord to the whole track. So it turned into a three chord yeah. sequence, you know, and it worked. And we were like, yeah, this is so much more exciting. I'm not hanging around anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So stuff like that happens. Do you, are you like doing, what is that software that you use where you can like listen to someone else's session? Do you do that and just sit and pick stuff? Oh uh, yeah, audio movers. Yeah, do you use so, that? So yeah, I, um, I use it with the guy I produce with, Tom. Yeah. Um, we will do that here. So I'll be like working on something. I'll be like, Tom, this sounds shit. Or, uh, <laughs> you know, please give me your ears. I've been on it all day. And he'll just like tune in. Um, but we tend to not do that. I, I, it's sort of like more problematic than anything, you know, audio movers. Yeah. And because you can't, because you, you, people are trying to listen. There's a bit of a delay. And then like, you also have to somehow offer your screen up for them to watch. And mm. I just, I, I don't like it. I'd rather just someone be in the room. It's, it's much quicker to have someone just with you. Yeah. Um, so do you like, do you both work in the same DAW in like trade sessions? We just work in Ableton. Yeah. 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 I have done. Ableton yeah. as well. That feels unusual for like, a band, if that makes sense. Like, I just feel like logical Pro Tools is just like this sort of default, but. Yeah, I just like, I, I just, you know, it's like closer to, you know, modular or something. It's like, it's just the routing and the, you know, be able to pull up like a Max for Live LFO and send that to somewhere else in the session or whatever. And yeah. Have, you just can't, you know, if you want to do it in Pro Tools, it's like, get out the manual, <laughs> you know. And, um, but we do track, we track like drums and, and, and bass and we'll track all the like live parts. We'll track in tools because we do it, you know, if I have to go to a studio, if we have to go to a studio, not here, then we'll track yeah. that in tools. And then I'll just sort of import it into Ableton. So we do use both. I suppose that's then the question is, because you are recording in studios, is how much do you feel you get done here 
And then at what point you take that to a studio? What is it that you're doing now? Do you write there or is it just like, now we've just got to get better sounding versions? Well, the studio is more like getting live drums, you know, like I can't yeah. do live drums in this room. Um, and then obviously we, you know, record bass at the same time because it's sort of like that's an interaction there between the two players. Yeah. And then John's uh, vocals will do there because we've got proper booth. And maybe we can get a decent mic, you know, rent a 67 or something. Yeah. Tell us about your studios as well. Like, John, what is your, what, where do you write and what do you put around yourself when you write? Well, we have a studio in Stockport where we rehearse, so I do a bit of writing there. Um, I could write here in my house, but I've, I always feel like people can hear me singing and it puts me off a bit. Because um, <laughs> obviously I sing in kind of a ridiculous way and <laughs> the idea of neighbours hearing me go, like <laughs> 10 in the morning is just sort of makes me cringe. So I go and do that at the studio. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I usually just do it with a laptop and a guitar, same as Alex really. Um, but with far less equipment, I'm very much a placeholder sort of wanger synth in so I can get my song on the go rather than try and get a good sound. You're not producing like um, a whole track. You're literally, you're doing more of a trad demo, basically. Increasingly so, yeah. Partly because I often find if I take it further, then it just sort of gets rolled back anyway. Not all the time. <laughs> Um, but that happens a lot, you know, and it's the, the song is actually more important at, at that stage for both of us mm. than a cool sound or whatever. So the, the productions, sometimes it can be the um, the thing that excites everybody, but it's kind of not a, not a great sign if that's the first thing, I think, because then it's like, okay, well, we've got a cool sound, but where's the song? So I try to see past it and get a song that feels great with like shit sounds. Yeah and then try and get the sounds a little bit better and then share it and then see what happens song and production wise after that. Yeah. That's the sort of uh, like Vince Clarkey way of like, he would write, you know, mega synthy music on a guitar. Right. And then, and then orchestrate it. But that definitely comes yeah. across like, um, I, was, I mean, particularly John, like, I want to ask you about your, uh, <laughs> your vocals. Cause it's like, like when I listen to the music, I'm like, I've always thought of everything, everything as a kind of like your vocals, especially as quite electronic, like in the sense that they, they have the kind of detail and sort of, they remind me of like stuff from Aphex Twin. They remind me of like, you know, they, they are complex, interesting, like melodies. Right. That are, that, and it's so, it's just really interesting to me how on earth you write them. Like, how do you, how do you do that? Because they're such an intrinsic part of the song. You can't take... You simply can't take them away. I don't really know. I mean, how do you write anything is is a tricky question to answer. I am quite used to the recording process, so I maybe I take a few more steps in terms of in, intricacy because I know it, it can come across. It would be hard to do that if you were in, you know, Led Zepp or whatever because it just isn't that sort of world. But I know this is going to be recorded and it's going to be quite a highly processed vocal by the time it gets to the end of the process because that's how we like to do it and that's particularly tom's uh forte is basically comping to a degree that is kind of absurd and like he, he really likes it to be perfect and we have a good relationship in that regard where it's like i know i can my mouth will be able to do this thing <laughs> but it's kind of an insane thing to do just in a room with a load of you know noise crashing about it's much more like a studio sound maybe that's what it is and when i play live i have kind of like a studio sound in my ears it isn't a very live sound i have my voice ridiculously loud and and compressed and stuff so that i can definitely make sure that stuff is happening rather than the more like wild shit that we that we would do in bands before i guess it's like yeah the clarity is something that i noticed i was like i can actually hear every word you say which yeah. is sort of i remarked to myself as like that's not is that normal? Like, it often, I often struggle to perceive lyrics in songs, and I don't know if that's just bad hearing. I'm not a vocalist, so this is not a discipline that I, I have a great deal of understanding of, but it's, I noted it. We're just stick, we're stick, Tom and I are quite sticklers for um, diction and stuff in the studio. We do sort of put that on John quite a lot. He sort of hates it, but... <laughs> I always think they make me over-dictate songs yeah. and over-enunciate, and then when yeah. you listen back, it's fine. But I, I do quite like the thing you're talking about, which is where you can't tell what someone's saying, even if it's really well recorded. I don't know. I think my style probably does require that thing. Otherwise, it's just going to sound like a madman 
can't understand, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it also, because it's falsetto, does it not sit in a frequency? Does it sit higher? What what frequency range does that? I don't know. Like, And therefore, is it easier to mix and easier to perceive, I guess? John John sings falsetto in sort of two ways. He has like a sort of head voice, like which is the normal way someone to do falsetto. And this other way is, you know, the one that John does, which is like full power, which I... What is that? I, I don't understand how he does it. <laughs> it's more. Like, it's a bit more like a, a metal scream, but without the sort of grit side. Yeah. So it should fit very well over, you know, like low tuned guitars and all that kind of stuff. But then the band, our band, doesn't sound anything like that, <laughs> and we're likely to fill any gaps there are <laughs> with something anyway. So I don't yeah. know. I think it's probably a, um, it's probably the same as any vocal, but it's just maybe. A, bit higher but it's not really it's not actually pitch wise it wouldn't be higher than a female singer yeah for example and i sing low quite a lot as well anyway yeah yeah exactly like you do you don't exclusively do that but i really like it and it's the i just good <laughs> i think it's because basically what it, the way of putting it when i say it's like reminds me of electronic music it's that concept of you know brain dance which is like the apex sort of reflex concept of brain dance being the electronic music that will make your brain dance that is that it yeah you know, the, the melodies are so fascinating and detailed that you can just kind of slightly bug out just listening to the following them it's like following a guitar solo i guess but it's it's your voice which is much more intricate than i would hear in other music yeah you know, i just don't i don't know other bands that would do that but i know like electronic music that would be a bit like that um also regarding the enunciation i did notice there was a very well pronounced at the end of like on the record on Mountainhead, there's like a, it's <laughs> it was just on its own, like it was perfect. Well, that's probably Tom's work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Tom has like a little folder of just those. Just, like little just, elements just to yeah. just like drag it in. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like animations. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously we talked about studios. Alex, we are surrounded by a lot of gear. Obviously, if John is basically predominantly laptop and guitar. What do you work with? What, what have we got like around us now? I'm I'm sort of the same, to be honest. If I'm if I'm writing a song, I'll just like I'll just forget most of this stuff exists. If I want to write a song, and then some days I'll come in, I'll be like, I want to play with some synths, and then something will happen. I'll be like, oh, I should record that, and then then you think, pull it out what, of the what, bag. What, later. What, what harmony will go with that later? And da, 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 and then suddenly that will turn into a song. So that happens sometimes. Um, you know, John came up and. And we decided that we were just going to start writing a song, you know, that way. And that led to like teletype, that song, because we're using the teletype. Perfect. And see what you did there. Very simple, very basic. So that will happen. But in, in general, if I find if I spend too much time just sort of fiddling, you never press record, you just sort of... Yeah. The, the world of modular does that to you. <laughs> it's antithetical to like creativity in some respects. So, sorry, I should say more specifically, it's like the the... The complexity of this is just a nightmare if you actually have an idea of what you want. Well, it's just the case of like, oh, this sounds great. But what happens if I do this? Yeah. Oh, that also sounds great. What happens if I do this? And then all of a sudden it's like an hour's gone. No music is written. Nothing's actually been recorded and you're like, so it's better. I, I find it better to just sort of have a track and then start to try and incorporate, you know, some of the stuff, you know, or process stuff. Mainly I use like all the Shreman stuff just for processing you know, the, all the guitars just went through that straight onto yeah. the track. I did all DI mainly this record. And, um, Why Schwayman? And what what are you doing to the guitars? As well, I, like, I like the pre's and I'd have uh, th uh, three, you know, I'd run it in three lines. So I'll just have it going through the, sorry. That's fine. I'll, I'll have going through the, the stereo uh, filter and then I'll have one that's going to the, um, the chorus, the Juno chorus. And every time I record a track, I have a bunch of, effects that will sit the guitar at a certain point in the field yeah and so as we're going through the song i'll decide okay do i want the guitar to be up front do i want it to be here da, da, da. and i don't have to dick about later like sending it in and out of processing okay. it just all goes in in one so you're using filters to sort of move stuff put it move stuff back, around and i'll have and i'll have and i'll i'll take uh you know lfos or whatever for, you know out the um expert sleepers and that will modulate to the you know things to be modulating always to the track and I just like hard set them I start a record off every time I'm like what am I going to use and I go this one this one this one this one and then I like just literally wire it up and I just think okay that's the guitar sound this record and then that'll be that hmm. and then just pick and choose afterwards did you you mentioned like the 
you were using the MMF2 for like stereo, or for like for binaural, like you were creating binaural sounds with basically a quad filter. Is it a quad? Yeah, it's, it a it's, a, it's a stereo filter, stereo filter but, but when you when you choose like two poles and um and you, and you send one signal in and then you've got like you know opposing one eighty degree phase LFOs or whatever, you can create this kind of like whizzing around your head kind yeah. of stuff. Strange stuff just sounds like it's like the Rolls Royce of it just, synthy, it just sounds synthy bits. just sounds really really nice and it and it sits up in a mix really nicely like verbal stuff I I love it but I find with a, like a full band and stuff it just like it just it just disappears but somehow Shreman's just like right there <laughs> <laughs> always on top of everything. Really I did hear this thing. like sort of like how much of it is modular like do you know what I mean like I'm like, hearing bits that sound like they would be verbosy sort of bouclery bongo tones yeah yeah well that's all that's all verbos stuff like the bouclery type stuff yeah um I guess like you just don't see it like as a band like if you know and I th I've seen you play as well and that's what I mean when it's it's not obvious how much of it is electronic and how much of it is processed. It's yeah. very hard to tell, obviously. It's very hard to tour with this stuff. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't, you know, I don't do it. I don't really want to tour. I, I, I toured a bit with uh, with it when we were doing um, I Want to Love Like This. I, I took like a small setup and it was cool, but it's like, I don't know, stuff just gets broken on the road and it just fills me, makes me nervous. Yeah, totally. Like if you're selling out a, like big show you just can't afford to have weird but you could just go you could go okay cool well let's make a cheaper dope for version yeah. or whatever and then you're like actually it's worked out far more expensive because <laughs> i need like 20 times the amount of stuff to make that possible there's no there's just no kind of shortcut way um luckily we have pete in the band who kind of like i'll explain what's happening and he'll sort of make that happen within ableton somehow yeah. like rooting things around and so when you play live, like are you, how much of it is, do you have like a backing track or is it, do you commit that it is all played? How do you? Pete, Pete's the backing track. Pete, the backing track. Pete, Pete is like the human backing track. What does yeah. he, how does it work? He just, he has Ableton, but he has like, he has uh, like sample pads doing loads of the stuff. And then he's got two keyboards here, another one here, and they're all kind of like split in half doing different sounds. Oh my God. One. He's just absolutely mad. You're like Pete. You know, some of it can actually just go on backtrack. No one can see that you're doing all of this. He's like, no. Yeah, must, he insists on it. He's like, it must be played. I respect that. It must be played. I respect, yeah, I mean, I, and it's a question. Like, I've done that. Like, I've literally been the guy who's like, well, you've written loads of electronic bits and I've had to, like, stand on stage and trigger and fire them. And then they, because the band, the band that I played with had a pathological hatred of a laptop being on stage, they were like, it is verboten. Like, can't be done, you know. But then... I don't know. Does it matter? Well, it's just you know you can't you can't do seven albums and just have like <laughs> somehow <laughs> a couple okay. of synths that you for yeah, every yeah, single just record somehow, like do that. Yeah, when we were like well, like any band, you like to explore different sounds and stuff. And the only way to be able to play all those different sounds, all different records, is to have some sort of like you know laptop setup. What are your like? I suppose then the question is like, what do you want from a live show? Like, what are your do you have like best favorite live shows you've seen and what and why um i like shows where you feel like it's going to fall apart at any second and the band pulls it back so when you see like nick cave or something it's like it's got a real kind of like you feel tense the whole time <gasps> because it's so chaotic i've never seen nick cave well i mean why what's he do it's just what when the whole band's do? playing and it's like it just yeah, you you got to see it. You got to see, right. see them. They're, they're one of those bands where you think like, is the song gonna end or are they found? When's when's the chorus gonna happen? And yeah, it's just kind of like it, it's a bit chaotic. So I've seen bands that are like that. Yeah, and our music is most of the time not like that. So you know, for me in our band, I like to be able to sort of bring a bit of that in somehow, in terms of you know having real instruments that are kind of like a bit uncontrollable. Yeah. What about you, John? What's your? I like that too when it's uh, not not controlled. You get a bit, it get a bit sterile sometimes. Um, listening to a click and all that shit. Um, but then there's times when I'm like so thankful that I've got the time and the pitch in my ear, and when, and I can't, can't hear anything else. You know, that's kind of unbeatable safety net. But maybe it affects uh, the emotional portion in some way that I can't perceive because i'm feeling too safe maybe i should feel a bit more on edge <laughs> do you play to a click track then you have a oh yeah yeah 
yeah, we had to do that. No, There's two it. songs in our arsenal that don't have a click track. Yeah, if the if the if the backing track goes down, you know, as in Pete's world just kind of like explodes, <laughs> we have two songs <laughs> which we don't even know how to play anymore. I think it's like it's it's uh, f- f- my keys, suffragette. Suffragette, my keys, my keys. maybe Photoshop, maybe Photoshop. On click as well. Basically, stuff from album one. Really? Why? Yeah. Why? Because everything after that went on the click, and uh, you got organized. Because I was still playing keys back then, right? Yeah, and we John, were. John was on keys. It was all extremely chaotic, <laughs> and then we got Pete in, and put started putting some things on track. And at that point, obviously, you have to have a click. I was going to ask about like the very concept of albums as well. Obviously, like as in concept albums, because it sounds like, you know, they sent me the whole, like, the text about this album and the idea behind it. I mean, we were talking about Daniel Eck before and this whole thing, you know, with Spotify, and, and maybe I'm being cynical and I don't really know the answer to this, but I get the impression that people don't, you know, cynically, I would say people don't listen to albums, but I don't know if that's true. I know people do put stuff off, you know, put stuff on when they work, but when do people sit down and actually, you know, turn the lights off and listen to an album. And that it would be interesting to get your thoughts both on the idea behind albums and why do you come up with the idea, the concept, the story first? And does that then inform the writing or does it just emerge organically? And just albums in general. And I obviously love it, but I, I just don't know if a lot of other people spend time listening to music in that way. No. I, don't, I don't think anyone does really. Yeah. Not, not in the same way as they used to. It's not the nineties anymore. Um, has changed quite a lot i mean in terms of the idea the, the sort of lyrical ideas that comes along quite late doesn't it john usually it kind of finds it kind of appears as you go along yeah i i might be considering a few different things and then i'll write something that i think is fits into this and then i might think well i'm gonna fit something else into it and go from there but i don't i don't think it's uh particularly interesting to have a really strict concept and have every song must align with this thing it's it's nice to have to keep it quite vague and just it's more like a a palette that you can draw from if it's an interesting enough idea then it will make people think about it you know when they're not listening to the record and when and, the, and it'll color all the tracks a little bit even if realistically they don't have anything to do with it um, but it gives it the whole sense of the record is more than just here's a bunch of songs it's got this added stuff to think about which i think is interesting it's like a novel and rather than just every chapter is a short story it's it's a novel and there's a there's a bigger thing to it a very a very vague novel <laughs> <laughs> but it's no it's interesting and it's, you know there's like there's imagery basically that is conjured up by the story that is attached to this mm-hmm. album and i definitely i was listening to the lyrics looking for does it actually have it in like the liner notes? Does it? How do you tell people nope. about it? It doesn't. It goes out in a press release, and we sort of allude to it a lot in interviews and in the promotional stuff. But we don't write it on the record or anything. That's quite a bit too prog. <laughs> and also, be, very few people will have a physical thing in their hand. Yeah. Um, so you just sort of let it. Basically, you you put out fragments of it, or you explain it in the song which is what we've done this time which is the most obvious way uh and then you let people talk amongst themselves and we have a the kind of fan base that really likes theorizing and and discussing stuff so you kind of throw them some r- red meat and see where they <laughs> take it um in the gap between the first single and the record itself and they usually they they'll create quite a lot of interesting lore and and backstory and stuff attached before the record even comes out and then there's loads more in there for them um for them to add on to are you thinking about it when you write i suppose is the question is it is it inspiring the melodies is it inspiring the instrumentals no. is it just the lyrics and the kind of it's, the, ju- it's just the lyrics and, yeah. the, and the way it looks yeah. sometimes i mean there's like there's I think there's one place where we've got some the sounds of like drips in a cave at the start of one of the songs which i guess you could say is the sound of the concept but that's the only place it, it, it comes into it and even then they don't even sound like drips and they're never explained <laughs> there's a like a baby laughing at the end of the album as well who, yeah that's it? alex's baby yeah i thought it might be kids yeah i put my kids in my tracks as well <laughs> it's nice when i write music i don't 
because I write electronic music, it's so often led by the equipment and the, the sound or like a melody that you come across. And I've never actually, and this is probably bad of me, and if I'd ever like studied music, then I'd be told to do this. But like, you know, if you actually create an image or a story, it does spark ideas. It does give you a, a thing. It has to have some kind of... It definitely does, but we, we put the music... The music has to be good without it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the mu- music's always sort of first, basically. The, mu- the song should be good enough without any vocal in. Yeah. You know, the drum track should be good enough to listen to by itself. Everything that comes on top of it is a bonus once the song's good, like the lyric and the concept and all that stuff. That's the side that people tend to focus on more because it's difficult to just say you've written some more songs that sound like good songs. <laughs> it's much easier to say, you've got this concept, tell me about the concept, and then that, that sometimes becomes the focus when the focus is the songs and the music, and we're a band that plays songs and music. It's quite a weird situation to be in because it's difficult to yeah to talk about. It's like the last melody. last record. It was like all they everyone all everyone wants to talk about is like the AI angle and mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff. And we're just like, yeah, the song's also there as well. <laughs> under, nice under, yeah. Yeah. Underneath yeah. it, there's yeah. some music. You know, <laughs> just, no one would care if the song sucked. You know, yeah. Like press will fixate on the things that they can conceive of and understand. But yeah, like. Do you write all the time? Are you, and you said you're in a bit of a musical lull at the moment. As soon as I finish a record, I use that time to literally completely power down from music for about a yeah. month or two. Um, mainly because I'm completely burnt out. Yeah. I find, you know, uh, writing with John and then doing the production side of it, like pretty knackering by the end of it. Especially this time around, because we have like this crazy deadline an obscene amount of work in a short amount of time. And you just, yeah. Do you mean you started late or you just we, got well, an arbitrary we, we, deadline? We got this, well, no, we got given, like, they were like, you know, it'd be good if you had an album out, like, na- this time. <laughs> we were, like, looking at our folders of songs that we'd written. We are like, hmm, haven't got any. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, okay, better go start writing. And it was, and we, and we got it done in time, you know. But it was, um, it was just like, it was just so full on and, when when that sort of comes to an end, it's like a massive crash. Yeah. Um, especially with like you got young kids as well, so like you're working crazy hours and then you know doing all the rest of it, you know, which you would know. But you've yeah, that. I mean, if you are like a father during the daytime and then somehow trying to find time to do that, I don't. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, that's why I work here, like in my house, because yeah. it's literally like you know sometimes I'll, I was setting alarms and getting up at like. I was like, well, the kids usually wake up around seven or come down at 4.30, <laughs> you know, and just like start finishing that bit of whatever it is, like comp, put my headphones on or whatever. It's just like, oh my God, what am I doing? But the time, once, but once it's over, I just, I like a, I like a break. Mainly because I just feel a bit like if I was to force uh, writing, I'd, f- I'd find myself finding it like not enjoyable. Like a job. You resent it. You resent yeah. it, yeah. So it's, it's best to just have a break, go off wait for the music to sort of come back to you. I just go off and I'll do other things. And then one day I'll be listening to the radio. I'll be like, oh, that's quite a good song. You know, and suddenly it's like, it's like the interest just suddenly just like just reappears yeah. and enters your brain. And then you're like, that drive comes back and you just want to go right. It cre- sounds it, on one level, people would say creativity isn't something you can just like force, but there is also that side that they say, you know, good artists or good you know, musicians, writers will just sit down and do the work, like just sit yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are times come. there are times where you're like, okay, I've got to write and I don't know, I'm a bit short on ideas or whatever. And you just go, okay, well, I'm just going to get in the room and just do it. And and that um, that often works. Sometimes I find, like going back to what we were talking about, you know, using gear or not using gear, I'll find, you know, well, right now I'm going to focus on one piece of gear and really learn it, like Teletype or, you know, Pulsar or whatever. And I'll just sit down with it and I'll go, okay, this is all I'm going to do today because I sort of hate myself and my life. And I don't want to write any songs. And all of a sudden you'll get to the end of the day and you'll just have like one of the best songs you've ever <laughs> Yeah, yeah and, that, and then that excites you. And the next day you come back and you'll be like, listen back again. You're like, okay, cool. Well, now I need these chord sequences. That could be better. Duh, duh, duh. And suddenly you kind of like, you, you springboard off again, you know. But in general, once the record's finish, I like to have a little break. What about you, John? What's how do you feel about the whole process? Yeah, same, same. I don't. Uh, 
I don't like music very much at the end of an album <laughs> cycle, or, you know, an album creation yeah. cycle, and then it's and then slowly gain interest back. It's usually the, a very similar thing where you'll hear something, you'll kind of go, "Oh yeah, I see what they've done there. I could probably do something. I could probably either do that <laughs> or do or or uh, do better than that." And it's that feeling of like, "I want to, I want to take that feeling that it just gave me and and give it to other people." Basically, not in terms of like literally copying stuff but it's more like something that we've not tried and then someone's done it and it can be a song you know it could be an elton john song from the 70s and i go well the way he, he changed key going into that chorus is so great I, w- I wonder what he's done there and you go and look into it and and sort of beat around the same bush until you get the same feeling what is your relationship to the tools as well john with like the you know if you're a vocalist and guitarist are you looking at synth plugins or like other things to find sounds to inspire you or is it always do the sounds inspire you or is it is it other songs melodies and things you no no they do sounds that do i feel like i've got more sounds available to me now than i could ever use and i know i have a fraction of what alex has got at his disposal um but it feels like sometimes it's just enough to get the to get the idea over the over over to someone over to the other guys in the band it's like i'll use a, a choir patch or something um doesn't matter if it's not the best one in the world um but it's like you get the idea this is going to be a choir type sound or this is these are strings it's the same old strings i always use but i do like it when i find a i find a new thing i'm not searching for that all the time and presumably you need to get it fast like i assume because if as with all of this it's what i say about the modular it's just like Whatever you use, you just need to, it needs to work really quickly if you have an idea. Yeah, that's the thing. You can cycle through, you know, 8,000 sounds on just the uh, the soft synths I've got in Ableton. Like one of those is going to work <laughs> for this idea that I've got in my head uh, or it will, it will for the next 24 hours or whatever. I get the impression listening through the albums that electronics have become more of a part of the sound like it's never just guitars. It's never just yeah. like uh, synths. It's it's. But do you see yourself doing something weirder in future? Would you? I mean, I don't want to say. It, I'm going to say. It. Would you do a kid A? <laughs> Are you going to kid A at some point? And just be like, fuck it. I let's. think we already. I think we did on our. We, we already did on Man Alive. Like there was. Yeah. Electronic stuff on our first record. Yeah, I don't know if we'll do a whole record. record of it. I don't know. I don't know. But it's like you've got an appetite for guitars, I guess is the point, or, or at least the sound or the, the way that you, um, the melodies you get from it. I don't like guitars at all, really. But, uh, well, quite, but, quite but, but, but oh, no, like, I, I enjoy playing in the band and I like doing things with guitars that you shouldn't be doing with guitars. But then, you know, when you're like looking through Instagram or whatever and you'll see some guitarists just like playing some... Widdly. Yeah. Widdly way. And you just see like, is this what guitarists like? <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't like that, you know. I prefer like, you know, we're all Radiohead fans. Everyone likes Johnny Greenwood or, or, or Sonic Youth. Someone who uses a guitar and makes it do something that's unexpected is exciting for me. And um, I don't know, I feel a bit like a lot of that's been done. And I'll, I really like the sound of uh, of synths. And then I usually play, you know, like I'll split the chord up over a few things mm-hmm. and then one of the notes will be the guitar and I'll just bed that in. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of time people hear the record, they're like, oh, there's no guitars in this record. It's like, it's absolutely shitloads, but but you can't tell they're there, or you can't tell what's a guitar and what's a synth because it's all being processed in similar ways, or you know, swapping roles kind of thing. I did talk to someone once who did, was doing a a Bach album on a Moog modular, but was hybridizing it with the orchestra and doing exactly that, where you just like roles switch interchangeably. And I, I suppose it's the idea that like on some level, all music now is electronic, no matter how acoustic it sounds, because it's gone through a computer and it's probably been processed and it, it's probably got like an 808 sub under it. You know, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that like, you know, Ed Sheeran live album, when it was mixed, an 808 was put underneath it, you know, and it's mm, just a, 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 a looping pedal, but chef, it's... Chef's kiss. It's yeah, just no. not <laughs> a looping pedal in an 808. Um, but everything is, to some degree is electronic because you just, you're just like, well, I'm just going to add to it. I'm going to make it sound better. But Yeah, yeah, there, there is an argument for o- overcooking and we do do that quite a lot as a band. How do you know when you've gone too far though? And how do you pull yourself back from that break? We call it, we call it doing a fucko. <laughs> 
<laughs> what's the fuck? Well, I mean, it's, it's what when, it sounds like. Uh, <laughs> most of the time, Alex has been sat at a laptop for like four or five hours, and the thing that we left him doing yeah. has yeah. long since <laughs> departed and it's turned into like something completely insane that probably sounded great to him three hours ago and then two hours later it was different and then an hour ago from yeah. now <laughs> he he won't recognize the original and it's like it probably does sound amazing if, if you've been on his journey and we're just yeah. going like, what the what is this he's fuckoed it or it's a fucko is the phrase <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's when you know you've gone too far and to be honest in an alternative universe, all the fuckos are on our albums, mm. and they're probably great. But sometimes it, it goes too far, and you lose the band, and you lose, you know, where where we came from, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What the fuck does sound like? Well, I, I want to hear one. Like, you know, <laughs> like what can, can you describe one to me? Like a good example. Um, this wasn't one I did, but this is a great moment when we were doing "Get to Heaven." Um, <laughs> oh one, God, yeah. Yeah, one of the tracks that wasn't on the main record, Habsburg Lip. We were working um, with Stuart Price. Tom and I were recording the, everything in uh, here in England. And then we were sending it to him in LA. And then overnight, he'd sort of like put his magic fairy dust on things. And uh, one day, he sent about Hacks Per Lip. And if you know the original track, it's like it's quite heavy sort of electronic thing. Um, and he just sent back just like straight up like... Uh, Peter Andre sort of reggae version. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's, oh, hit me, baby, with your Habsburg lip. <laughs> and, um, and we were just like, what is this? And uh, John, was, John was absolutely fuming at it at the time. Yeah. And then, and then funny thing was, that he went straight in the bin at um, Angelic in the studio and on the computer. And then about four years later, Tom and I were there recording another band. And, um, and they never delete anything. So I was like, go in the, go in the bin. See this. It was still there. Yeah. I listened to it and I just thought, this is so good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, right then, and I was like, we should have done this. This would have been awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. I Things sound differently at different times of your career. That's basically. cool being like ahead of the curve, isn't it? <laughs> like, yeah. head, fuck, that's amazing. Yeah. And that then leads to the question, which is, uh, I was, I read the, I got, uh, I got an email the other day. I got like, uh, I'm subscribed to like, you know, medium things. You get like interesting like dissertations and thoughts. And there was a guy who was talking about the Beatles and he was saying what was so good about the Beatles is that, especially or latterly, obviously, is that their music was very weird and it would, t it would just, you get really unexpected changes. And the way that he put it, I thought was really good is he's like, but they always made it feel inevitable. And it's that idea that you can have really odd changes in a song that are not what people are not traditional, whatever that is. And I, and I do think like you, this, your band has, has some of that. There are changes and shifts in the songs that are perhaps unexpected because the songs are very interesting. They're just interesting. They're much freer and opener, opener than a lot of the music I've heard on the radio. And I suppose then that's the question is how do you, and this is sort of, I guess it's probably like a slightly anti fucko is how you, how do you write a, a song, a whole song from start to finish that has that sense of inevitability, even though it can do really weird things? How do you keep it sounding like, oh, no, that is, how could it be any other way? Well, and I know that's like hindsight when I listen back well, to it. Well, there's like a bunch of times where, you, we, where we'll, um, you know, we'll have two songs and both songs just weren't up to scratch, but there may be like a good bit from each song. Right. And then, you know, we'll literally just go, dunk. <laughs> You know, within Ableton, put two songs or parts of songs together, and then and then it's a, a case of jacking the keys around until they feel either inevitable, as you say, or surprising in a way that we yeah. didn't predict. Mm. And that's the same with the the time. How fast these songs have got like a twenty d BPM difference. If we put this one up ten and that one down ten, yeah. are they both ruined? Does this one suddenly get better? Does this one get worse? And those little things make weird stuff happen those little decisions yeah and then you spend a lot of time you know i'll spend quite a long time just doing working on like just transition you know how would you transition from one section to the next to make it feel natural those are the things what, what are your tricks well I'll, I'll, I'll loop if you know like when you're working on a track you often find yourself like you know doing a looping a section but i'll i'll loop over the bar lines i'll loop halfway through the chorus into halfway through the verse okay yeah and i'll just like be going round and round just thinking like how can i improve that or uh, and I'll, I'll think about guitar parts like you know note choices that i can overhang or 
Like if I hit this particular note, then I'll be in, you know, I'll be in a slightly weird note for the next chord or key, but it will still work in a way that's kind of like suggesting a cadence or something. Cadence is over the bar line and stuff like that. Hmm. I never thought about like looping, putting a loop brace over the join, you know. Over the join and work out just like what's delivery. going over, what's still overhanging, what shouldn't be there, what, you know, do you want it to be a hard, do you want like an edge? Sometimes you want like an edge on a song where you want it to be like, bam. You know? Yeah. And sometimes you want to feel like you're naturally being taken somewhere deeper and then the bang comes later, like at the chorus or whatever. Yeah. Tell me, like you were t- alluding to like, it's Tom that you, is like the other producer. You have like a producing sort of duo. He's like, Tom's like from a engineering background. So right. he engineered with us on, from the second album. Yeah. I grew up with him. I've known him since I was like five. So. Oh, okay, that's good. So we're just like really close friends. Yeah. And, um, and we can both sort of tell each other we're being terrible or whatever, <laughs> you know. And it's okay. And it's fine basically. Yeah. And we know what we do well and what we don't. So. What does Tom, I suppose there's like two questions. One is I'd be interested to know more about what he does and like how it works. And also just like the role of producers in general, because you obviously work with like James Ford and other people and like, you know, it, it, I don't know what that means really. Like, what does it mean to work with a producer and to, for them to have some influence over your music and what are the positives and the negatives of it? And how does it, what, what have you learned from it? Uh, I mean, working with James Ford was interesting because he he used he said to us, you know, when someone asked him, uh, you know, what does it mean to be a producer, and he just says, oh, "I help people finish their music." Yeah, and like in whatever way that is. So, does he need to help write the song a little bit? Does he need to play on it? Does he need to do this? Does he need to do that? I think that's probably the best way of describing the role of producer. And also, there's the kind of like you know, sometimes the whole band is like arguing over something. And then I'll have to put my producer cap on, <laughs> but I don't, I, I feel less guilty because I've got Tom <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and Tom can step in and go, you know, right. You, you really should do this. What Alex is saying, you should do this kind of thing. <laughs> and then it's like, not so bad then, you know? So it's important to have someone there who's basically got the final say sometimes, okay. but mainly it's just someone who will help you finish what you're doing in whatever way it is, or someone that just sees it as a place for it to, you know, some, somewhere, you know, final destination or whatever. Yeah. Do you remember any of the like lessons, the sort of songwriting lessons? I've I read some of that. I haven't read it all, but like the Rick Rubin book, which is quite interesting. I don't know if you read that. I haven't it's read like, it. I haven't read it's it. It's very spiritual, but it's good. It's like, you know, it's interesting. I don't, I don't just... recognise this at all, was the story we heard about him turning up to, um, he was turning to London and, it, and had a team over there that were mixing a track and he came in, sat down and the song was playing. He went, I don't recognise this at all. And then he put on ACDC and then he left. <laughs> and that's the story I know about Rick Rubin. Oh, wow. <laughs> so James Ford never did that to you. No, that's, no, that's probably no, good. No. James Ford's very, he's very fast. So him and Stuart are very similar in that way. Very, very fast, very quick workers. David Coston, you feel like nothing's happening, but loads is he's sort of very quiet and in the background. <laughs> Sometimes you'll turn it over, turn around and you're like, what's David up to? And we'll just be in the corner, like on the move, just pressing one key really slowly. Like, <laughs> you're like what are you doing, David? Oh, sorry. <laughs> he's, he's that producer. Oh, wow. Okay. And then who else have we worked with? Uh, Johnny, John. John Congleton, yeah. Congleton. He, he works extremely fast, like crazy fast. And um, when you say they work fast, what do you mean? They just like, like just like get quick. more done, get more done, just get it do, done. Do one take and then you say, right, now I'll do a good one. And they're like, no, no, you're done. Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's Congleton. Yeah. And, and J- James Ford's just fast on the computer. Like, He's like whipping his way around Pro Tools like it's Ableton. Like it'll just be like yeah, yeah. making huge arrangement changes. And it's just crazy how fast he is in that. Um, anyway, I mean, that's more like technical skill. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, but as, as actual people, they're all like really interesting people. Like yeah. David Coston's like a fascinating man. And, and so, you know, they're all really, and they all sort of impart like years of knowledge that you don't have. But how does it work if you're producing the album? You know, if you and Tom are producing, do you... Is it the same? But how can you be in the band and produce the band, I suppose is what I mean. Um, With great difficulty. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, not really. Uh, not really. No, it's been fine, actually. <laughs> okay. I, th- I think it's, it, it's always been a little bit of, that's been the case, you know, working up demos like very far. I've always done that even before they've gone to, we had another producer come on board. It'd be like, they'd be sonically very, very, you know, you sure, like, sure of themselves. The yeah. songs will know their identity sonically and also the writing you know always like to be like massively prepared 
before we start having to, you know, pay someone a lot of money in the studio to do it. We work the songs up really far and then and then um and then when you go into the studio they often find a new it's usually down to the drums. So you'll go into the studio and you suddenly realise that, you know, obviously electronic drums and real drums have a totally different sound. Yeah. And you'll think, well, okay, well how can we use these live drums in a way that's either gonna fit in with the demo or you know what, we're here, let's do something a bit more interesting and then Sometimes I'll like throw the whole track sonically and then I'll have to like come back and oh, rework, rework it all back up. To match the like impressiveness of live drums. Yeah, or just like the the tone the tone of the track could be like the synths need to be sort of It's like usually hairier. the unimpressiveness actually <laughs> oh, no. of the live drums. Oh no. Because electronic drums are incredibly powerful and they're perfect every time and you can have six kick drums or whatever. I know that's not allowed, but uh, <laughs> you can do a lot of things that a drummer can't do and it's going to sound incredible um, or a sample, you know, of something that sounded has sounded great for 50 years. And then you get in there and you play it on real drums and it quite often sounds kind of quite white, I always find. Like it sounds like a, a function band. Um, if, you've, if you've got like a really funky beat that sounds cool when it's electronic and then you play it on drums, it sort of starts sounding a bit lame and you have to come up with all these ways to like de it. <laughs> um, and quite often that we'll find that we will have one element we'll keep electronic. So we'll have a, a hi-hat, which is a drum machine um, that's getting processed and stuff. But then the, the rest of the drums are being played by Mike and yeah. they're more organic sounding. And that's a really good way of mixing it up. So no one's sure quite what's going on. And we haven't just chucked the drummer out <laughs> and replaced yeah. it. Mike. Sometimes you, you, you basically want to do as little as you want to the drums, you know, little like, as in the timing should just be Michael. Yeah. And the songs are going to be a bit hairier and that's kind of cool. And then sometimes when it, when it, you want it to be more electronic, I'll do things like, I've, like for this last record, I was using the swing on the circle on mm. and then just like, you know, setting in like a, a tick, a trigger into, Ableton and I was literally like going through his drums and lining them up with the, the swing of the circle on to get oh, wow. it to get it in time with the original thing or whatever. And so sometimes you, you go like that route and the other times you go the other route. I was listening to bits of that album and I was like, I cannot tell if that is a drum machine or if that's real drums. It was like and maybe it's that maybe it's the sound of real drums that have been like amazingly brought into well circle on obviously has like insanely good timing but yeah but with yeah. an electronic swing i think of the drum sounds in like the nigel godrichie drum sound is like i definitely hear some of that that like dry it's a really nice dry drums that he seems to create and i do hear it on your records too yeah like that kind of well it's they're really it's good just, because you um, can have when you've got small tight drums you can then have quite a lot of stuff around them if you yeah. have like big hairy ballsy drums it's quite hard to then go, okay, well, we actually want bass guitar, strings, <laughs> synths, voices. So a lot of that is down to like, you know, how big is this song going to be? And then you think, okay, well, if the song's going to be really big, with lots of elements, then I need the drums to sound sort of smaller and tighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we talked about um, the Joshua Tree a few albums ago. It tends to come up. And Alex was always saying the drums actually sound really small and therefore the drums, the, the songs, the U2 songs sound really big as a result. Um, which goes against what you might think. You'd imagine, let's put some big drums on, like Nirvana. Yeah. It doesn't always have the effect you'd expect. Well, you, yeah, well, you have the opposite effect. You, you use more, you know, you can make a, get a really, like, ballsy, roomy drum sound, but then you have to put those drums quieter. And then and then the, the energy that comes from the air moving, which you get through, like, the room mics and stuff, make them sound really energetic and pounding, mm. even, even at a quieter volume, which is what I've, you know, Joshua Tree sounds a bit like that to me mm. personally. It's that idea that when you mix things, you, it's bad to EQ things in isolation, right? It's just that the, all of the frequencies of everything, all the other parts are going to combine. Um, I'm sure, like, you know, bass guitar and drums obviously need to work together and, and some of what people will perceive as the energy of the drums will come from the bass. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 are, yeah. Which yeah. Can, you can only hear if there's room for it to exist, right? Yeah, so yeah. Like, Alex, I wanted to ask you about these things a bit like particularly things like teletype as well these are very like esoteric unfriendly odd ways of approaching music creation and i suppose it's more just like your thoughts about the effect of like what what do you enjoy about them um well teletype's the only thing i have now that's like 
intensely kind of like deep as it were you said like you were saying like, that's it that and your quasar like the only the things quasar, that have a, any kind of screen any right? type of screen and, and and you have to sort of menu dive a bit because i'm my brain's not really good i just forget how to use everything um but with the teletype i do love the teletype but i use it i'm, I'm a very basic user I like it to power, like to power off the verbos uh, sequences because you can sort of just like put a little bit of code in that will do you know Euclidean rhythm, yeah. and and you're you're away and and it's a bit wonky like every time I press play it will do something slightly different and sometimes you're like bam you're like oh my god this is great like the way it, where it's decided to fall on the bar with the whatever you know and I, I kind of f- find the happy accident side of it like what I f- is quite exciting. Mm. Um, and I know there's like people, you know, you see people on Instagram using like teletypes and then you're like absolutely mad. Yeah, oh my God. Like, like one guy's got right. it like controlling the lights in his room. Like, <laughs> so it's like, like what the hell's going on? You know, uh, how do you have time to do it? Do you have kids? Yeah. Like, yeah, I know, I've, got, I've got no, I've got no background in programming. The reason I got it, I was like, you know what? I'd really like to be able to do a bit of programming because I've never done it before. And I know it's not like a particular language that anyone it's sort, been made up for that. It's made up, that, yeah, yeah, exactly, or something like that. But I was like, you know, it'd be quite a fun thing to sort of just wrap my brain around on an evening. Mm. And suddenly it just started to like leak into, you know, it's just become a, like a little bit of a brain. Mm. I had this like, uh, a few people I spoke to on this podcast who talked about like doing things they weren't very good at over and over until something good came from it. It sort of almost sounds like you're describing that yeah, in some yeah. degree. It's like... What, Making things really hard, like, like for example, if you don't play the piano, just like I'm going to play the piano incredibly badly. Well, I find for two I, f- days I find that's until. the best way to write, you know, to to, uh, to write sort of pop songs. You will find yourself writing like simpler things when you're wrestling with something you don't understand. You know, you're co- you're sort of like trying to work out how it works, and then your ears will hear something that you're creating and go, you know what, that could be a song, yeah. and, it, and it's very simple. You know, you you create something extremely simple. And, and, and that's what's sort of magic about it, you know, whilst if I was to pick up guitar, which I played like all my life and I was like, I'm going to play the most complex thing possible. I could easily do that. And I could run through, you know, a bunch of keys and blah, 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 blah. but it's like, no one wants to listen to that. That's you know? weirdly way, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is why I'm sort of like, well, that's jazz. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, I like, fe- I like feeling like a bit of a novice and a learner. And I, you know, I find that more exciting for me, um, in, you know, making music. That yeah. Way it like will box you in in some way yeah what about you john do you have like ways of getting out of your normal habits and patterns yeah i um i sometimes try to write songs without an instrument at all so just singing things into my phone um in the sort of michael jackson way um or just singing to a click and trying to basically hold the whole imagined arrangement in my head while I sing what I think the vocal would be. Yeah. Um, because there's there's absolutely no skill required in terms of, I, you know, it's not going to take me half an hour to program in these notes. It, they're just already there because I'm imagining them. And yeah. then try and build a track around that. And that does, it does work and it does make interesting stuff happen, but it usually makes me write songs that sound very like me if you know what i mean they sound like songs i've written before or they're too simple to be engaging enough i have i will often find which actually if you listen to like all of michael jackson's albums in a row you start to hear some a lot of very sim- similar things going on in terms of what he's done and i think that's because he's write, written a lot of these songs just by doing that has he um yeah you get this particular duh, 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 thing that he does at the end of every um, middle eight in an incredible number of songs or some variation on that. And it'll always, the, nearly all of them have got these two chord verses. But anyway, that's him. It's interesting. There's like a default way your brain's going to go when it comes to creation. Um, and it's trying to shake that up is the, is the trick. I suppose that's why if you've got something that you're singing against that's weird or different, then it's suddenly going to yeah. be like, oh, well, okay, what goes Which with that? Which is why it's it's great that when Alex sends me something that I would never have written, and I, sometimes I don't even musically agree with, you know, I'd be like, why would a chord do that? Or like, why would you repeat that? Um, it throws me off, you know, it throws me into a new way of being, which is good. Yeah. Tell me about TV Dog. 
Yeah. Because mm-hmm. that's just that. And I really, I was struck by that. I was like, this is really nice. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a really good track, but it's also just really simple. And it's just you. And like, there's like, there's something that starts and then there's another thing that joins. It's and just that, some strings and yeah, a voice. Yeah. And that's it. I, I, mean, I was interested in a lot of the record we were talking about, sort of New York, you know, based or, or origin, originating from New York, sort of strings, sort of music. Um, yeah. And I was thinking a lot about um, about the Reed track, the dun 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 dun. dun. What is it? Street Hassle? Is it called Street Hassle? Something like that. I can't remember. But that particular song has got this kind of like very simple strings thing. And I I wrote, uh, started writing TV Dog, whatever it was called at the time. And then I sent it to John, and then John changed the strings up a it's little bit. Coney Island. Coney Island, yeah, mm-hmm. you see. Coney Island yeah. strings. And then um and then John just sort of worked worked uh one of the sections up and then we just sang on it and it was literally done in like a day or two. And then I went down to the Abbey down the road and took a, you know, Zoom recorder and just recorded ambience. Oh. And then just put that in the track. Oh. And then that's it. Oh nice. Yeah. That's I've heard for people who like when they record tracks they'll hang a mic out the window as they're doing it. So it's like, mm-hmm. you know, you get the world yeah. break, baked. We in. had we had the option early on to in fact I think I wrote probably two more verses or three more verses because they're quite short. And we cut them back, we cut it back down. We had the option of opening it out, bringing in drums, making it into a big song and all this stuff. And it, every time we did it, we just liked it less. And we just thought we'll it'll be like a sweet, short, sharp shock type song. Well, not shock, but you know, just like a nice Here's the melody presented twice. Yeah. Why why complicate it? We don't like the feeling as a band of hanging around. That's like one of the biggest dislikes is music that you feel a bit like. Jog on, mate. Yeah, well, it gets too indulgent, you know. And I feel like yeah. we've been guilty of that in the past a little bit where you think like, and you have to think to yourself like, you know, I'm a little bit bored of this by this point. And someone else who doesn't like the band is going to be <laughs> very, very bored of it <laughs> if, they're, if they're subjected to this. And um, and we don't like much of that sort of mood on a record either. We 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 turned our back on sort of like having too many tracks that are like you know low energy. We would say even though it's it's got a lot of emotion yeah, in it, yeah. but it's not like rhythmically high energy. We always like to just think, okay, we'll have one or two of those max on a record. And that's yeah. kind of our our rule of the like the sadder sort, the sadder slower, yeah, not the big like anthemic kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just have to have one or two just because otherwise it's like you know. Also, they feel very easy to, for us, they feel quite easy to write those sorts of songs as they, they, they come across quite quickly. And because they're quite quick to write, we instantly kind of think they're not very good because we haven't had to work that hard on them or, or hasn't like pushed us in a, in a way that's sort of like made us feel uncomfortable, which is what, we, you know, we generally like to be made to f- make each other feel uncomfortable <laughs> musically. <laughs> musically. Okay, yeah. That's fine. It also sounds like it's the benefit of having a band is just this sort of, you've got at least a few people who can just be a filter to like stop, start, go, don't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes I have to say stop and sometimes the band says stop to me. It just works both ways, it's fine. It's it's sort of, once you get to sort of album six or seven, it's like we are very blunt with each other and no one really gets that offended. Mm. You know, it's it's a different sort of relationship by then. You know, often if you if you're working with a with a new writer, they've got a lot of, you know, they're sh- sharing themselves in a way that they've probably not done before. And so to have someone say, you know, this isn't very good, or this should be swapped for something else, or you that you you will, you know, they'll hit back or they'll insulate or whatever. Mm. But we're used to just sort of doing that with each other now. A, a lot of the reason why we can work so quickly is that we can navigate the songs quite quickly yeah. in that sense. We can say, you know, this bit's good. This bit's okay, but I wish it was doing this or da da da. You know, this bit's cool, but the song doesn't need that to happen at that point because we've just had this happen and maybe it should go down here and then da da da, you know, whatever. So there's a lot of sort of pressing the sort of detonation button on something that may have taken one of us like three days to, to make, you know, and it can just happen and then all of a sudden the song gets better. And that bit that we threw away will end up in another song like two years later or whatever. So yeah. It's not the end of the world. Or like nine years later when you find it in the bin, you're like, oh, actually, we should do a reggae album. <laughs> um, what, I mean, what is next? Like, would you, do you think of like, are you the kind of band where it's like, well, we've done that, you know, we've got to do this, or we've got to try something. If you say you want to make yourself uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's next. Probably too early. You're obviously about to play this live a lot. and 
And you were saying you're doing a Kit A record. I'm kind of like, in my mind, I was thinking of going the other way. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and it being like, like well, everything must be like an organic instrument. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, we say this every time we make an album. Yeah, though. we do. We do. <laughs> I mean, we I would do. like to do it as well, but I, I don't know if we would, we'd ever do it. Like that. Yeah. Did Bjork do an album where it was just all her voice, you know? Yeah, and Rozelle, mm. like beatboxing. Yeah. I'd like to find I'd like to find a new instrument, you know, and just sort of work on something new. That's so just like a thing. Yes. I was thinking lap like lap steel or something. Okay. Lap steel and sax. Well, well, I've got, I picked up this bridge. It's got the bridge, I don't know what it is now. It's like Passerelle Bridge. What's that? So no, it's this new bridge and you put it in your guitar and you put it on like 16th fret and it basically turns your guitar into like a koto. Oh. So I'm going to play with that next. Oh, wow. Just finding something like a new thing that I can sort of sink my teeth in and feel like I don't know what I'm doing again. Yeah. That's not a modular and it's not a synth. Exactly. It's yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, it's Steve Reich, isn't it? He's like, oh, I don't, I don't mess with synths because they just sound very similar. They don't sound, they don't have, you know hit a th an organic membrane or something it's going to sound different every single time mm -hmm. well yeah but you can you can you can you and i both know you can patch it I to know. make it sound like, different every try time try harder steve like <laughs> yeah <laughs> Shit, since, don't put that on me <laughs> your hang-ups what a uh, final question is what is the future uh, this is like a music technology podcast really in effect but it isn't also about writing music but what what do you want to be the future of music technology i mean I would really like to, to own a door yeah. that just works. Oh my God, no no chance. Yeah, I just like, I just like to turn on my computer and not have <laughs> some problem. An update. Like Ableton's great, but I don't want warp engaged. Oh yeah, yeah. I want it off all the time. <laughs> I think you can say Well, it make, you, we should make our own one. When, when, when you record one. into Ableton, when you record, it ultimately just puts it on. So you have to continually go in and, and turn it off. Does it? You, yeah. you can turn auto. You can turn auto warping off. To auto warp, warp off. I'm talking about when you record in. Yeah. It kind of puts it into whatever your kind of default setting is, and it says. I mean, this is so boring now. It's but right. um, this is this it, is it, this is really <laughs> bugged me. Just made. This is so <laughs> annoying. We and Tom are dealing with um, phase aligning. You know, process drums through modular with the real drums, and so if I were to send something out from Ableton to him. If warp was on, even though it wasn't complex, they say that if it's not complex, it shouldn't be on. If warp is on at all, then Ableton just like stretches everything. Uh, so by the end of the track, you're just like slightly out. And it's different every time you turn the computer on. So <laughs> it just, it's just annoying. I just thought I just want that works. I just want it like a, a, some sort of AI door that knows what you need and just gives you what you need and and keep it simple. It's it's like, not, sooner or later, it's just going to be like. You turn on Ableton, it's just a chat GPT prompt, right? It's just like, what music do you want today? Yeah, well, I just want, I just want it to be, I, I like things that are simple and they work. Like, I like my workflow to be like, you know, just totally uninterrupted and, yeah. and quick. I like to be able to come in and just press a few buttons and then everything's just on and I'm off. So flawlessness. Is yeah. Flawlessness or simplicity. Yeah. It sounds like you're describing those like old... <laughs> like Sadie or whatever, those really old, like, you know, the old disc systems that didn't really do anything except just record and I know. play back. Maybe that's what you need. I don't I know. know. Uh, maybe. ADAP. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome, actually. I mean, people had that right. On to DAP tapes, yeah. What about you, John? What I mean, do you want technology? Or what, if you had, if you could invent a tool, or what, what do you dream of? No, I think anything I would want, we've already got. AI music doesn't, doesn't excite me very much but i don't think it's like the devil's music either i think if people want want it then they'll take it the same way we always do stuff if people are end, if people end up listening to ai music and not caring about that then so be it you can't deny your emotional response to something mm. um, and that's all we want at the end of the day is to feel something yeah i don't think humans are ever gonna are going to want to get away from like an artist and you know a story no i don't think so either but i also think that ai all it's really doing is bringing together a greater number of artists than you can hold in your head and recombining what they've already done into something else that a human could also do and yeah i don't really like the idea of not a person not creating it but 
if you put the music in front of me and I didn't have that knowledge, Would you, I wouldn't would you be able know? to tell. Mm. And I don't think the generations below us will be able to tell or will care, especially when it starts getting into the realms of being personally tailored to the self and you can get songs instantly written like that are about your your actual life <laughs> rather than just relating to somebody like you are the star and, you, and the song is about the guy you fancy at school or whatever that's gonna be something we couldn't predict because i can't do that for every 12 year old girl in the world can i it would take too long but <laughs> it's perfectly feasible so that's that's a that's a mission for you, John. That's yeah, the next yeah. that's the next album. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a, was a mission for Elvis. It was a mission for everyone that's come before. How many yeah. people can you get to relate to this without making the music really shit? <laughs> um, and an AI can do that, unfortunately. <laughs> that's why we made a record called Mountainhead. Well, I mean, that 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 appeals that should appeal to like nearly the entire world as long as they understand what it's about <laughs> ha <laughs> uh, yes indeed mountain head it's out now you should get this record in fact you should almost certainly buy it if you have the means that will help support the band enormously and go and see them play i saw them last night at the brudenell social club they were excellent and it was extra interesting seeing them play after having had that conversation that we just heard with them because i was watching pete um alex mentioned pete who is like uh, the fifth sort of beetle on stage because there's a it's a four piece but there are five people on stage and Pete is amazing amazing he had a laptop and controller keyboards and he had a synth and I think another keyboard Pete was doing all of the other elements that make these songs work you know the little like distant past kind of little voices and things that all these like spot effects, all of these moments and then layered components. Like there's parts where Alex will play the guitar and Pete is playing with him perfectly because as Alex said, there are a number of sounds that are hybridized. It's guitar mixed with synth and they do that on stage in real time, uh, which is very non-trivial. And his timing is outrageously good. He was like absolutely on it um i was very impressed because as i said i've actually done this job not to anywhere near the extent and complexity that, that any, everything everything song is obviously but you know i've been the sort of um for a band that wrote a load of synthy parts and are like oh crap how do we play these live because we've all got our hands full well then you need another person that will just somehow magically translate it and you have to make a a sort of creative decision are we just going to play stems or are they going to trigger those sounds uh, and play the little riffs and you know you can make it as easy or hard for yourself as you want and what i noted was that pete has made it quite hard for himself <laughs> I think, from what I saw him doing. He reminded me a bit of, like, Animal from uh, Sesame Street. At certain points where he was, like, absolutely, like, ruling it. It's interesting as well to see the whole monitoring thing on stage. You can see that they're all wearing in-ear monitors. So they're all, and they're all playing to this click track, and that is helping them be in time, hit those points, and John, more than anything, to sing. It is amazing what he is able to do with his voice. Uh, incredible. So I really enjoyed the show. And if you get the chance to see them play, you absolutely should. Go and see them. They're touring at the moment. And think on these moments. Yeah, like there's a lot of like little bits and bobs of trying to understand their process that I will dwell on there. Uh, not least um, Alex's in efforts to make the modular useful in a music production standpoint because... If you have or do not have a modular synth, as these like big things that were behind us that Alex has, I can tell you that modular synths are amazingly powerful, but that they are really like they are basically a place that you go to distract yourself and not produce music. That's a hot take alert right there. And it was interesting to see that his approach is to effectively use them as really complex processors and especially 
to write the music first in simplistic ways, you know, like John's using basic, basic, basic sounds and tools because at the end of the day, if you have a crap song, you can't make a crap song into an amazing song with cool sounding modular synths. You literally have to write a good song and then you have the luxury of firing up a modular synth. And because you know what it is that you're going to capture, you hope that you get less distracted by the process of patching a modular synth. They would record guitars and then run them through the modular synth to place them in space, to move them around using stereo filters and other tricks to kind of create, to spatialize and enhance acoustic instruments. That's an interesting hybrid and it's really non-obvious. You have no idea that really listening to the record that that's what they'd done, but that's what they'd done. The whole thing of putting like the loop brace over the transition Meaning that, uh, you know, in if you don't make music, you have a brace that's like a sort of start and end point and you can push a button so that the playback will just loop around the start and end point. And just placing that over the transition to listen to how the, you know, it goes from one section to the next is an interesting idea. One thing I didn't say at that time and it occurs to me later is just that can be misleading because... <laughs> If you listen to the same little section in isolation over and over and over, it becomes its own little island of music. Um, and you can sort of blind your side yourself because you've missed the context of what has led up to it and what happens afterwards. I interviewed Colin Newman from the band Wire once, and he said a really bonkers thing about how he makes music, which is that he doesn't use the loop race and that he does long, long takes from start to finish, you know, when he's going to record a part, he hits record with the like cursor placed at the start of the song and he wait, the whole song plays until his part is due to come in and then he adds his part from that point so that he has the whole context of the song. However, what makes me laugh is that that would lead to fuckos because you, you end up listening to that little loop in isolation your context reframes, and then you probably add loads of things thinking, oh, that sounds amazing. But, you know, really what you're doing is creating techno because you're listening to the same one-bar loop anyway. And then suddenly four hours later, you've done a fucker and you've created a it's like reggae version of your track and when actually it doesn't fit anything around it. Which isn't obviously to say what Alex is saying is wrong. Of course it's not. Only that it's it's hard. It's actually hard in many respects to do that because you lose the the context of the whole song. And I also like this whole thing of exploring something that you don't know, teaching yourself a device or some piece of technology, because the benefit is that because you won't know what you're doing with it, you won't be able to bring your old melodic habits to it. You'll have to, you'll like almost have your hands slightly tied behind your back. So you'll have to be using your ears more and clinging to what music you do get from it, which will probably be something slightly weird and different to what you would write. Because, you know, if you're used to playing a keyboard or in Alex's case, if you're used to playing guitar, like your hands move in certain ways and places, they'll go to certain chords and then from those chords to other ones. Um, whereas if you use a mono teletype, which is um, this thing, basically the teletype is like a little um, mini computer that goes in a modular and you can type code. And um, Alex is a proponent of the teletype. And after our conversation, when we stopped recording, um, Alex, I was like, right, come on, show me the teletype because we talked a bit about it. And he's a big, big into it. It's like you write little scripts, little bits of code like a very simple language and those little bits of code kind of do things like fire off little fire off events in your modular synth, make melodies. And it's kind of interesting in its abstract nature. And I think it's a perfect example of what he meant. You know, you, you are learning some weird abstract language and you're tinkering away and you peck at the thing and you hit enter and, and listen back to what happens. And you obviously don't understand enough about a teletype to be able to completely realize a dream. You're learning maybe a few commands at first, and it's just about what can I squeeze from them in that moment. And it's gratifying that he gets good results for it. I mean, there is a track called Teletype. Um, an everything, everything track, and it's named after that device. And interestingly, if you are modularly inclined or not, let me tell you about something that you might find interesting. 
There is a thing called VCV Rack, which is a free modular synth like software. And if you download VCV Rack and just Google VCV Rack, there is a teletype for it. There is a full, complete recreation of the teletype that Alex has, which you can run within VCV Rack yourself right now. VCVRack.com. And I would recommend getting teletype uh, if you want to mess around. There is a learning curve, as with all things worth learning, um, but I will link to the tutorial that Alex actually sent to me. It's like an example of like, this is a good starter tutorial. And I'll put links to other things that we discussed in this episode down below. So I'm conscious that there may be people listening to this who are not sort of into the modular realm. I'm also, my job, by the way, you've never met me before, but I'm a, I'm a modular synth enabler. I'm here to help people get into modular synths by making YouTube videos primarily. But yeah, I want you to know about VCV Rack and the fact that you can try a teletype. So if you want to kind of mess around in like following Alex's footsteps, you definitely should. Um, I pass this on as Alex has been basically trying to get me to buy a teletype now. Um, and I am only able to resist to a limited extent. I don't take much convincing. Alex, John, thank you so much for your time in speaking to me. Thank you, Everything Everything, for being excellent. Their album, Mountainhead, is out now. You can stream it, but I would encourage you to buy the thing. Buy a compact disc or a long-playing piece of wax and support the band as best you can. Help them carry on, keep making more wicked albums for years to come. I have a Patreon, if you'd like to support Why We Bleep. That is patreon.com forward slash Mylar Melodies. Please consider sponsoring on Patreon if you can. That is the absolute best way to support us. But please also tell your friends about this podcast if you enjoyed it. Let them know that is also the other best way and is free of charge. Go and see them play, listen to some music, and perhaps make some noodles and teletype. Make some weird riffs that you're outside your comfort zone and take you to places that you wouldn't musically go because you're using a bizarre piece of technology to do it. It's free. Something for a Sunday afternoon. There's a whole back catalogue of why we bleeps to listen to if you are so inclined. But for this one, that's it, friend. Thanks very much for listening. Bye.